Harris decides to continue his raids into southern Germany to reinforce the threat there and pressure the Germans to spread out their defenses. Munich, the birthplace of the Nazi movement, and the largest city in Bavaria and fourth largest city in Germany will be attacked next. Munich is a noted focal point for the German railway system in that region and contains seven transportation targets. Munich also contains eight important aircraft industry related targets including the BMW Aero Engine Factory located in the north of the city. 15 engineering and armament facilities, 9 chemical works, and several utility, rubber, and foodstuff facilities round out the noted war-related industries. Weather forecasts are promising with few of any clouds forecasted over southern Germany. The crescent moon will be below the horizon for most of the bombers' long journey to Munich, increasing their odds of evading German night fighters. The route chosen is similar to the previous night's attack on Nuremberg as Munich lies only 100 miles to the south. Two turns are plotted, one near Dieppe on the French coast, the second marked by pathfinders at the northern tip of the Amur Zee. White target markers will be dropped at Pue on the way to Munich and at Hasla on the way back to England to aid in navigation. Only Lancasters, Halifaxes, and Stirlings will be sent. The crews of 264 bombers awake on March 9th to find their names on the battle order for tonight. Filing into the briefing huts that evening, they sit and listen to the details of tonight's attack. John Searby leads 106 Squadron's briefing tonight at RAF Syrston, while Ron Reed sits and listens to his own commanding officer's briefing at Linton on Ouse. Incorporating lessons of the previous night's attack, the Pathfinders will open this attack with 13 H2S equipped Y aircraft marking Munich with red indicators, while also laying a curtain of white illumination flares across the target area one minute before zero hour. 16 backer ops following behind at 1 to 2 minute intervals will drop green target markers on the aiming point if they can visually identify it, or aim at the center of all red indicators if they cannot. Due to problems illuminating Nuremberg the previous night, additional flares will be carried by two backers up to supplement the initial illumination effort if required. The main force will open their attack at 23.49 and end at 24.15 hours, some 26 minutes. To prevent the undershooting of bombs seen the previous night, the aircraft will make a timed bomb run from the Amur Z to Munich. When over Munich, the main force will aim at the center of the burning indicators and not attempt to visually identify the target. The attacking force is divided into four waves, 44 Lancasters from one group attacking from 2349 to 2400 hours, 83 Lancasters from four and six group attacking from 2353 to 2403 hours, 40 Sterlings of three group attacking from 2355 to 2405 hours, and finally 86 Lancasters from six group attacking from 2403 to 2415 hours. Concurrently, a major mine lane effort by 62 aircraft, mostly Wellingtons, will attempt to lay over 150 mines off Kiel, the Little Belt, Heligoland Bight, the Frisian Islands, and the Bay of Biscay. Eight Obo Mosquitoes will also launch harassing raids on several rare cities this night. Briefings concluded, the crews kit up and head for their aircraft. John Searby, feeling the effects of flying his 8th raid in 16 days, fills his jacket pocket with caffeine pills to combat the drowsiness. His Lancaster joins the queue of 8 others on the runway at RAF Syrston. Throwing two bitter tasting caffeine pills into his mouth, Searby opens the throttle and his bomb laden Lancaster rumbles down the runway to join 263 other bombers heading for Germany. Crossing the coast at Dieppe, the bomber stream encounters Little Cloud from the coast all the way to Munich. The crescent moon sits low in the sky to the rear of the bomber stream, before dipping below the horizon one hour before the bombers reach Munich. However, unforecasted winds are encountered which upset the timing of the raid. The bombers first encounter resistance at the numbered boxes of the Cam Huber line. The fighters of Nacht Jadgeschwader 4 shoot down a Sterling before the bomber stream passes through the German positions. Flak and searchlights are encountered as some bombers stray over major cities along the route to Munich. Over France, all was quiet. But, nearing Saarbrücken, we saw the waving spears of the searchlights and the flicker of shell bursts. I kept well south of the frontiers to the Rhine, then passed south of Stuttgart, where there was much activity. Entering the southern named boxes, the bomber stream encounters elements of Nachtjagdgeschwader 4, along with Nachtjagdgeschwader 101. 
Well, one fighter from NJG4 shoots down a Lancaster. The combination of jamming and the Moonless Knight again neutralizes the efforts of NJG101, who lack their own onboard radar. Operating nine aircraft. No contacts with the enemy. From the enemy side, powerful jamming of all Freyas and RT in all CGI boxes. 30 minutes prior to start and at the time of the through flights, from 22, 25 to 1, 31. Engagement of enemy aircraft in area without Liechtenstein equipment made harder by lack of moonlight. Continuing on, a Halifax, possibly damaged and seeking safe haven in neutral Switzerland, crashes into Lake Constance, killing the entire crew. Approaching Munich, the Amr Z shows up clearly on the Y aircraft's H2S sets, and green and white flares cascade down at the northern tip of the lake, identifying the starting point for the bombing run on Munich. Approaching the target, the Pathfinders find ground haze and darkness obscuring Munich. Only seven of the 13 Y aircraft have arrived over the target, and of that, only three have functioning H2S sets. As a result, too few illumination flares are falling over Munich to adequately illuminate it for visual marking by the backers up. Unexpectedly strong radar returns from recent suburban construction deformed the image of Munich on H2S screens and caused the first two Y aircraft to drop red indicators four miles north-northwest of the aiming point at 2403 hours. Several backers up, unable to visually identify the aiming point in the light of the few burning illumination flares, drop green indicators as ordered on the only visible red indicators they see. At 12 minutes past midnight, a Y aircraft drops their red indicators and flares one half mile north of the aiming point, but it is too late. At least 40 bombers from the various waves have bombed on the concentration of red and green indicators four miles north-northwest of the aiming point, drawing the rest of the bomber stream to the conflagration. Ron Reed is among those crews drawn north by the errant markers. His bombing photo is plotted four miles north-northwest of the aiming point. Target was bombed from 1500 feet at 012 hours. Identified visually by the river in the PFF marker. Ground markers were in bomb site at time of release. Huge explosion was seen north of Marshalling Yard, lighting up the whole target. The glow of the fire could be seen 80 to 100 miles away from the aiming point. 15 minutes past midnight, the center of the attack begins to shift southwest, resulting in a gas holding facility exploding spectacularly. The rest of the bombing occurs in this area, drifting slightly southwest for the next 25 minutes. John Searby and his crew arrives 10 minutes after Reed. A marked change in the quality of the opposition had taken place since our December raid. The flak was heavier, and a whole forest of searchlight beams lit up the scene. Already the smoke from fires was rising to great heights, and amidst the clutter below, the red indicators showed up plainly. Clear, thick ground haze and smoke. Target was identified by red and green target indicators, and two green TIs were in sights when bombing from 17,000 feet at 022 hours. Saw 4,000 pound bomb burst. Attack was fairly well concentrated, and one big explosion was noted. After 50 minutes, the attack is over and the bomber stream leaves sections of Munich burning as they head back to their bases. Leaving Munich, the bombers head back to England on the same route they flew in on. Passing south of Stuttgart, additional white indicators are dropped to aid the main force's navigation. The jamming of Moonless Knight prevents Nachtjagd Geschwader 101 from achieving any kills against the homeward bound bombers. However, the fighters of Nachtjagd Geschwader 4 exact some measure of retribution. Four bombers are shot down as the bomber stream passes through the numbered boxes of the Cam Huber line. The future top scoring crew of NJG 4, Oberfield Webel Reinhard Kolak and Field Webel Hermann, are guided by ground control to two Lancasters, resulting in Kolak's 13th and 14th victories. Six RAF bombers survive attacks from German night fighters, while 15 other bombers evade approaching night fighters. The rear gunner of a 149 Squadron Sterling successfully fights off an attacking JU 88, saving his crew but at the cost of his own life as his gun turret is shot to pieces in the engagement. Mm -hmm. 
Munich suffers major damage. Photo reconnaissance shows that while the residential center escapes heavy damage, bombing the northwest and western districts hits many industrial and military facilities. The BMW factory assembling aero engines is put out of action for six weeks. Also hit is the Mannheim works producing submarine engines, the Max Foch works producing sheet metal, the Krauss works producing locomotive and armored cars, and the J. Radgeber works producing railway wagons. 294 military buildings and 141 small workshops are hit or destroyed. 14 cultural buildings, 4 churches, the cathedral, 11 hospitals, and 291 other residential buildings are destroyed, as is the Nazi party headquarters and Hitler's Munich apartment. The mine lane mission sees 47 of 62 bombers lay 115 sea mines and all 8 oboe mosquitoes deposit their bombs over the Ruhr. RAF analysis shows that of the 264 aircraft dispatched to Munich, 32 turned back due to mainly technical problems and 218 attacked the primary target. Of this, 52% of crews placed their bombs within 3 miles of the aiming point. Performance between the groups was roughly similar, with most placing 50-60% to of their ordnance within 3 miles of the aiming point. Analysis of the pathfinding marking leads to criticism of the Knight's Pathfinder crews. Despite the inaccurate wind forecast that threw off the timing run from the Amr Z, it was felt the Pathfinder crews should have recognized the error from the image on their H2S screens. Notably, the aerodrome north of Munich showed up clearly on the H2S screens and should have indicated to the Pathfinder crews they were too far north. All Obo Mosquitoes returned to base, while three mine lane Wellingtons were lost, one to fighters and two to flak, a loss rate of 4.5%. Eight bombers from the Munich raid are lost, six to night fighters and two to flak, some 3% of the force. Using radio intercepts and crew reports, Bomber Command estimates the Munich force suffers five losses to German fighters and two losses to flak, and one loss to unknown causes. Amongst the German people, the main topic of discussion at the moment is the air war. Last night's attack on Munich was extraordinarily heavy. Many cultural monuments were damaged and even destroyed. Again, the question arises, how is this to continue? If the British are able to attack a German city night after night, it is easy to imagine what Germany will look like in about three months' time after these bombardments if we do nothing effective about it. In view of the steadily increasing English air attacks on German Reich territory, the Führer has ordered Göring from Rome to his headquarters. The meeting between the Führer and Göring will take place during the day. On this occasion, the Führer will bring to Göring's attention all his misgivings about the air war, and insist that we now try with all our energy to regain the initiative. I am told that the mood in the West German cities is somewhat cracked. One can imagine that the constantly repeated air raids are beginning to exert a certain influence on the moral attitude of the population. Having launched two major operations in two nights, Harris stands down his forces on March 10th for rest and refit. Taking advantage of this lull, many squadrons send crews out on night flying training exercises, while bomb aimers from 424 Squadron Royal Canadian Air Force spend their afternoon in link training. The staff at 83 Squadron Pathfinders take a different course of action, ordering up a bus to take their crews to Cambridge for local celebrations and drink. However, the crews of two Obo Mosquitoes are sent to conduct nuisance raids over the Ruhr, while 20 Lancasters and 15 Stirlings from 3 and 5 group are tasked to lay sea mines from Biscay to the Baltics. Three experienced crews from 106 Squadron who had not flown the previous three raids are sent with this force. Both Obo Mosquitoes successfully bomb and return to base despite heavy flak and searchlight activity. 30 of the 35 mine layers lay 115 mines for the loss of two Lancasters and crews, both from 44 Squadron. 